Good morning, and thank you, commissioners, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and everyone participating in this important hearing today. It's a privilege to be with all of you. I'm Beth Babcock, and I lead the Crittenden Women's Union, which is a Boston-based action tank dedicated to helping low-income women and their families reach economic independence. I say action tank because in addition to serving 1,400 clients a year with transitional housing, job readiness training, parenting, and other programs, we also do research and development designed to create new programmatic pathways out of poverty and use our applied learning to make macro change through public policy and new approaches to inform the field. Much of the Commission's work has highlighted the close connection between poverty and child outcomes. Enough so that one of the most important headlines credited to you is the startling fact that zip code is more important than genetic code in determining one's health. CWU works at the very center of those causal connections between poverty and family outcomes, and I would like to share with you what we are learning. Your work has shown that environment itself shapes children, both in body and in mind, that the course of children's lives is often cast by the availability of basic resources such as stable housing, safe neighborhoods, high-quality child care, healthy foods, opportunities for exercise and play that wealthy families can readily buy and poor families fight a failing battle to approximate. Children in poverty endure the grinding stress of insecurity and worry about where their next home will be and whether there will be food on the table. And this stress shapes them in very distinct ways. It makes them more subject to diseases such as hypertension and diabetes, and it also shapes the coping processes of the mind in equally predictable ways that may protect them and ready them for lives like their parents' lives, but not necessarily for breaking out of poverty and achieving the better futures that we and their parents hope for them. They become molded in childhood for the economic insecurity that snares them and thus disadvantaged to break free. This commission seeks ways to smash this mold of poverty. You rightly suggest that we should improve the environments in which our children are raised, create better housing, eliminate food deserts, promote safe neighborhoods and dozens of other valuable improvements. You advise that we should improve children's opportunities to learn the skills and behaviors necessary for them to change their futures, complete education, and attain solid careers. All these recommendations are necessary and laudable, but most of children's hours are still spent within the home, eating and sleeping in the environments their parents can provide for them, and learning the behaviors and skills their parents are able to teach them. We at CWU have done research, along with many others, that show that the average low-wage earnings are only 25% of the level necessary to provide a safe and economically stable home. And the battle we wage to loosen the grip of poverty and its molding imprint on children's development, their health, their well-being, their ability to attain careers that will satisfy and sustain them, is a battle we are not winning. One of the key factors in this losing battle is that the pathway to family economic stability has drastically changed over the past 25 years. In past generations, unskilled workers willing to work hard could often attain jobs that pay solid wages. But the labor market has become increasingly bifurcated, and almost all jobs that pay family-sustaining wages now require post-secondary education. And the increased competition for unskilled jobs left for the at the bottom of the wage scale are driving those wages further down. Stress on families at the bottom of the wage scale has increased along with unmanageable debt, unstable housing and family homelessness, and the host of attendant medical and social consequences, developmental consequences that we discuss today. Children watch their most important and powerful teachers, their parents, struggle every day to fill an impossible and growing gap between what they can earn and what their children need. They see their parents combat for survival. It's akin to growing up under fire. I know this sounds dramatic, but staff in my organization call it the war of the crisis du jour. Every day, sometimes multiple, multiple times a day, we hear our parents say, oh my God, now what do I do? 
This boot camp teaches poor children very different skills than those by children growing up on the other side of the economic divide, where resources are more dependable and they are not constantly buffeted by crisis. Wealthier children watch their parents model the 21st century navigational skills necessary to successfully manage the longer, more complex and costly path to economic independence that exists today. But what if we could partner with low-income parents to mentor them in these 21st century navigational skills? What if we could help them develop the decision-making capacities necessary to optimize their family stability, mental, physical, and social well-being, nurture their children, improve their money management, education, and careers? What if in learning these skills, they were to improve their earnings and thereby dis decrease the stresses on their families? And what if in deploying these skills, they provided powerful new models for their children that changed their children's lives forever. CWU started asking these questions six years ago, an amazing new knowledge coming out of the fields of neuroscience and medicine from leaders like Dr. Schoenkopf, behavioral economics and decision-making sciences, social science and networking theory caused us to radically change our approaches. We shifted from trying to teach families how to teach their children to read how to search for and obtain housing, how to manage their money and obtain jobs, and instead began coaching them on how to assess their own strengths and weaknesses, how to set long-term goals, how to break these goals down into manageable steps, how to problem solve, juggle competing priorities, muscularly develop persistence and resilience, and most importantly, to do these things because they wanted to because what they were pursuing were the futures that they wanted, doing it their own way to meet their own dreams and needs, not to address some external program requirement. Now this may sound implausible and grandiose, but I assure you it is not. What we are doing is mentoring families in a process we call mobility mentoring, using a very concrete scaffolding called the Bridge to Self-Sufficiency, which helps families simultaneously assess themselves, set, and manage their own goals in five areas. Family stability, well-being, money management, education, and career management. We provide them with mentors who use tools and coaching frameworks designed to help the families begin to methodically exercise problem-solving, decision-making, and interpersonal skills that increase their rates of attainment. We're now working with over 300 families a year in these frameworks, in transitional homeless shelters, in drop-in centers, and in multi-year programs. These families are seeking employment, gaining savings and education rates that are at many multiple times higher than benchmark. For example, across the country and in greater Boston, community college six-year graduation rates, that students coming in at the beginning of community college, at the end of six years, only 10% of those students across our nation have completed and attained a degree. 10% of matriculants. In comparison, our families, our disadvantaged families, over 80% of those families in our public housing-based multi-year CFO program have attained associate's degrees or higher within two and a half years. 10% of these families have already bought their own homes. 10% of them. When nationally, only 5% of young single women of any income class own their own homes. These families have saved thousands of dollars per family of their own funds, attained semi-skilled and professional jobs, and in the process have experienced measurable increases in their personal well-being and improved family stability and relationships with their children. Their children are seeing them do this and are learning the skills they are seeing, and these children are experiencing gains of their own with their parents setting goals to obtain care for their medical and mental health needs, core evaluations and improved IEP plans, enrolling them in better schools and daycares and summer programs, and helping them apply to get into college themselves. As Brendan, the special ch needs child of one of our mentees, says, my mommy and me, we have a whole new life. This work is new, very new, as is the science it is based upon, but what it is quickly pro proving is that there is a common underlying set of decision-making skills that can help us improve the way we assess problems, weigh options, juggle priorities, set goals, and manage our interpersonal relationships. These skills can be shared 
and they can be acquired from childhood all the way well into adulthood. They are the common set of navigational skills which enabled us to find our way through the tangled maze that has become the pathway to successful adulthood. We have learned that partnering with parents to acquire these skills gives them the tools to break their families free from the powerful grip of poverty and its imprint on their children. We should do all we can to provide low-income families the opportunity to obtain these skills. In doing so, we give them the tools to both provide for their children and the skills they need to teach them to become resourceful, competent navigators of our 21st century world. Thank you.